Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got beep, 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 beep. Beep, 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 beep. Wow. Was that actually it? It was. That was my name. And Good if you job. haven't figured it out already, folks, and you can do this yourself, we are going to be talking about Samuel Morris. And that was my name Ooh. in Morris Code. So, first off, how amazing I love, is that? I love the pronunciation M O R S E. You really think Morris? Not Morse. So first of all, you know I don't spell well. That's true. Or pronounce well. You are the resident lexicon for unprofessional engineering. I am. I am. Uh, and I would probably call him Samuel, is what I would Sam U L, like hyphenated almost. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're such a jerk. Now that we've Samuel lost everybody. Morse. How are you pronouncing it? Say it again. Morse. Morse. Not more is. Morris. <laughs> okay. Morris. I don't know if I'm right or not. Maybe I it feel is like Morris. You are. You're definitely right. Okay. Born on April 27th of 1791. That's that a, a long year. time ago. That was a good was it? year. You remember it well. <laughs> that was huh? a good year. He was in Charlestown, Massachusetts. That's weird. Um, his name, Samuel Finley Breeze Morse. Um, he was he was born to a pastor. Jedediah Morse, which is a solid name. It's and Jedediah. His, you can't go yeah. wrong with that. His mama, Elizabeth Ann Finley Breeze. I guess that's that all was I got. A, I guess that was a thing to like pull in like your your mother's maiden name into like your name and you'd attach it to like, I don't know. I feel like I should do that. Like, what would I be? I would be I would be Luke John Byers Mahelsik. Wow. So I would be LJ. Why? Oh, because John and, and then. Yeah, yeah. So John and then my mother's. Yeah, that would be. I, I just I gave away that. all my. I just gave, gave away all my passwords, by the way. Oh, yeah. I'm not going uh, to say it then because of that reason. But I already have my mother's maiden name in there. So I am much like Sammy Morse. How nice is that? Yeah. How nice is that is right. Sam, he went to school at the Phillips Academy at nine and then he got into yale college at 14. So, so hold on let's think about this for a second so let's say your kid's doing bad at the phillips academy because which he was, he was he was quote unquote an erratic student <laughs> so let's send him and i don't think it was yale college at the time it wasn't university they're like you know what we'll do we'll send him to the most prestigious school we can possibly send him to it probably yeah. cost back then a boatload of money and see if it does any better. What, you know what my parents would have done if I was doing bad at the Phillips Academy? Not send me to Yale College. They might send me to Yale College, but like it would go to be a janitor or to cut the yeah. grass or something. It'd be like, no, yeah. you're done with school. Go get a job. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but no. not to go to school. You're right. And it turns out he was just as bad in college <laughs> as he was at like whatever elementary yes. school or whatever he was Skin in. of his teeth. What I thought was interesting is when you're bad at college, you know, you don't like school. What do you go and study? Obviously, you study religious philosophy. Obviously. Math and, quote, science of horse. What the heck is science of horse, Luke? My guess is it's like animal husbandry, where like you learn about how to take care of the animals and feed them and train them. And it's probably, it's probably like a veterinarian thing, I would, I would guess. I, I guess. I don't know. It seems kind of ridiculous to me, but I like it. I also think it's funny that it's like religious philosophy on one hand, which obviously his father probably had a heavy influence on that. Makes total then, sense math and like anatomy on the other side it's like what an odd yeah. combination so but what's oh go inter ahead. interestingly and this isn't the first time james we've done a lot of these like famous inventor things i would say most of the people that we've covered other than maybe two or three they were all they all had issues and these were people that like everyone not, has issues Luke. Well, i know everybody not you has issues, but everyone but like, else but they're not people that you would look at that would you would think would be like a, a world changing mm. inventor you know what i mean like you think that's oh that's so that goes to show you that even if you're not like the top of your class or you're not the valedictorian or salute the victorian whatever it's called i forget what that one i is. think the, that's the, the definitely it person. i definitely pronounce that one right no you one know, remembers that second. doesn't mean you can't have contributions so let's let's all you know 
Yeah. Any of you schmoes listening out there, <laughs> you could be as impactful as Luke and I are oh, as we, well. We are. Fun fact, Luke. Yes. To make uh, to make beer money on the side, Sam painted portraits. Apparently, because he was pretty good Unlike at it. school, yeah, he was actually good at painting, which is interesting. And that's where his love was. Could like, you imagine passion. having such a like so apparently he apparently he kind of didn't want to do it for a little while. He was just doing it because he was good at it. Like he yeah. was interested in like other things. Could you imagine like you're literally one of the best painters of your time and you're like, yeah, I really don't like doing it. You know, I just I do it because I have to to make ends meet. Could you imagine like having a skill that uh, that you're that good? And I know you have multiple skills that you're this good at that you kind of are throwaway skills. Uh, but you, I you focus on the ones that I'm bad at. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like podcasting. Just yes. So after graduating general. from Yale, so he did actually graduate from Yale, 1810. Oh, hold decides, on, hold on real oh, quick. While he's ahead, in shoot. Yale, he's also attending lectures about electricity, which, you know, kind of, of factors into some of the stuff he did later on. But what I was thinking when I read that is like, OK, so first off, you got horse science. Then you're taking these side electricity lectures. This sounds like some Dr. Frankenstein stuff going on, right? Yeah. I mean, back then they did some weird stuff. I mean, they were flying kites with keys and like electrocuting, you know, yeah. they were, you know, the whole Tesla and Edison guy, they were like electrocuting animals and leaving them places to discredit Elon? each other. Elon? No, no, guy? Nikola. Oh, that one. The less known one. Yes, okay. the, the less so, known one. 1810. Tell me about that. 1810. So he actually graduates from Yale. I'm, I'm guessing it was in horse science, whatever that <laughs> happens to be. Uh, he decides, okay, I go to school for horse science. I go to school for... So I'll go into publishing. So he goes to Boston, becomes a publisher. Obviously. Um, and... He, I guess he gets disenchanted with being in the publishing industry and his parents help him get over to merry old England. Uh, this is like literally like a year later. Ye um, old England. So, uh, so he goes over there and he starts to study art because apparently his parents, you know, finally understood his misunderstoodness and were like, you know what, we're going to support your artistic side. I think that's really interesting. Maybe they were like, hey, you gave it the old try, but old, now old go do try. something you're decent at. So they sent him over and he decides that he's going to study with American painter, even though he's in England, uh, Washington Alston. Oh. Uh, the War no. of 1812 shows up. Uh, Did yeah, I say yeah. that name wrong? No, you got it. I just okay. was going to say it wasn't Washington, like a lot of those Philadelphians say. Uh, I assume New Jersey says that, too. So I love you. you there's always a war tie in. This isn't a great one, but it's there. Uh, so War of 1812 kicks off between the Brits and uh, the Americans. America. And apparently he becomes like he's in the he's in England and he's like he becomes this very pro-American uh, person at the time, the English cats are like, yeah, we don't like that you're being pro-American and hanging out here. Um, and uh, ultimately, he makes his way back home. So he was only there like four years from what I could tell. I don't know if you had a different date. No, he wasn't there very long. But what I did see is while he was there, I, th I thought this was kind of weird. He made a statuette named the Dying Hercules, which oh, was see that. Yeah. by name, you know, Super it famous. was Hercules dying but he also made a painting by the same name which i think was kind of just a painting of the same thing that the little statue was hey. um both really well received you know a lot of a lot of fame coming his way from those things but i thought that was kind of interesting so he gets back home 1815 America. they did they did not appreciate the way he painted they were like eh. no. so what does he do he starts taking pictures of people no no he just starts painting portraits of people so let's take a break for a word from our sponsor. So I have to assume our sponsor is uh, Yale. It It is not. It is not Yale. But really? we do have a couple of good shout outs. Those are way better because we way don't better. give money for shout outs. We basically and just give free advertising for people. <laughs> we hate money. So there's that. Uh, but our first shout out is from Han. Han is a super nice guy and says hi there newer listener here and i wanted to say that i love your show i wanted could to he not that's also true i also wanted to add that georgia tech provides some affordable 100 percent online graduate programs for out-of-state students 
such as their online masters of science in cybersecurity, computer science, <clears throat> uh, and analytics, which are all around ten thousand dollars. Not too shabby. Not too shabby at all. So um, thanks, Han, for that. If you so haven't checked out, did we do Georgia Tech? We did do Georgia Tech. It just went live a couple oh, of I'm weeks ago. I can't remember when we do these. I'm sorry. That's pretty bad, Luke. We recorded that one less than a month ago, I think. Come on, man. I know. I'm sorry. Who else do we got? Next, we have Jeff S. So Jeff has been a listener for basically forever. Uh, and so it's really cool that he's still listening and writing in and whatnot. He says, hey, guys, love the show. And I enjoy your enjoyed your latest episode on my alma mater, Georgia Tech. Nice. So Georgia Tech's really bringing in the uh, write-ins, which is cool. I do have one pretty major correction, though. Rat, R-A-T, rat caps are gold, not red, to match the school colors, white and gold. Red is the main color of that redneck school over there in Athens, which I believe is the Bulldogs. Um, he goes on to talk about tuition rates and acceptance criteria from back in his day, which is a lot closer to like the back in your day time frame as oh, well. So really nice. long ago, right? But it's really crazy to see just the difference in like costs, right? Of what people pay to go to Georgia Tech now, as well as the acceptance rates and what it took to get in back then versus what it takes to get in now. So really interesting. Thank you, Jeff. If any of you want to write in and say hello, if you want to talk about Georgia Tech, if you want to talk about Yale or horse science, anything like that, why don't you go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe, like, share. We love the reviews. And as always, you can tell your smart devices to play the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast. And don't forget, stop by the Unprofessional Engineering store and buy some really overpriced stickers and t-shirts to help subsidize Whoa. James and I's living. Fact. All right. You're talking about portraits, Luke. Yes, please do. Oh, I am? Oh, I thought you were going to. So, okay. He came back to America. Um, he set up an art studio in Boston. He got married to Susan Walker Morse. They had three babies, so that's nice. Um, what? He was busily painting a portrait at one point of Marquis de Lafayette, you know, that dude from Hamilton. From show, yeah. Yeah, long time listener for sure. Um, oh, real quick, uh, go check out the portrait of Lafayette on the Googles. My goodness. Uh, either Sammy Morris was a very, very bad painter or Lafayette was a really unattractive man. But <laughs> something was not right about that portrait. But anyways, uh, what's going on here? Someone shows up while he's painting this portrait and was like, hey, man, your wife is kind of sick. You should probably go check on her. And he's, you know, far away. He was like in Washington or something, and he had to go to Virginia. And so he does that. But sadly, she died a few days before he made it home. And she was only 25 years old. So very sad. Um, he also painted some portraits of some other lesser known folks like George Washington. So, you know, good for him with his portrait stuff. So his portrait painting is actually considered some of the finest portraits done by an American. And you want to know why? And this is this is from the in he's the only one I did through my Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, he combined the technical competency in the bold renderings of his subject's character with a touch of romanticism. Huh? Yeah, uh, yeah. I came up with that myself. I mean, you are a great art appreciator, so there's that. Well done. Um, so a whole bunch of stuff happens, right? He gets married again, has a couple of, he squeezes out a couple of other kids. Uh, Did he have and, some more? Oh, I didn't see that. I'm gonna yeah. So he got married again. I think he had three more kids, and I'm gonna roll wow. all the way up to 1832. You got anything um, before that? I think this is probably the same place I was going. So go okay. ahead. So 1832, just like anybody who's riding on a ship, you know, mm -hmm, coming mm -hmm. back from, you know, Europe, you just conceive the idea of the electric telegraph just as you're sitting on a boat. Um, I've actually had that happen to me before. And then people were like, well, that's really antiquated and already exists. So it didn't <laughs> so, work out. So apparently it wasn't like a from scratch. It wasn't like he had an epiphany. Uh, but apparently he heard some conversations or overheard some conversations. Eavesdropping. About a newly discovered electromagnet uh, 
Uh, so the idea of the telegraph actually has been around and it existed since right like the, the mid 1700s, like 1750 or so. Um, but they were only able to send messages like it was pretty terrible. It was like it was like it's like 10 feet or like, yeah, it's so bad. Or something like that. It was like, yeah, I could just say hello, <laughs> hello. And, and they would hear me without having to go through a wire and do yeah, a telegraph. for sure. Um, so uh so he probably they're thinking that his actual first working model which I'm, i'll describe specifically how it works in a moment they're thinking was probably like 1835 is whenever he did his so do you want the description and then get into some other things or what do you want to do yeah do that so uh and this is genius like i i watched a video because it's really difficult to see like what this thing actually looked like and how it worked. Cause everybody thinks it's a little tappy thing. Like oh, yeah, tap, for tap, sure. tap, tap, tap. Like that's what they think it is. But that's like the second generation, the original generation of his device. Imagine a long piece of wood and then they would put these, these letter or word slugs in the center of the wood. And they were like, they had profiles on them that were pointy and long and they would drop and it would be pointy, pointy, long drop. And each one of these slugs represented a word. So you would basically build a sentence and you would put it on this piece of wood and you would run it underneath a, uh, a follower. And that follower would tip on a pivot and it would either make contact, not make contact, make contact for a longer period of time. So it'd be like tap, 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 and you would basically push the piece of wood through like one sentence at a time. It would disconnect and reconnect the power through the circuit. You could go, you know, hundreds and you know, I forget how far it was. It was like 16 miles was his original one, something like that, or maybe 16 kilometers. And on the other end, there was an electromagnet and whenever the circuit would be complete, it would move it back and forth. And then they had a pencil connected to the bottom of it and the pencil would do like would basically duplicate the profile of those word slugs. And then you would just use a map knowing what, you know, Morris code meant like long, short, long, long, short. And then you'd basically just transcribe it and you could basically send a sentence or a word or a paragraph or whatever it was in literally minutes versus like weeks, like Pony Express to go from coast to coast or 16 miles, whatever it was, would be like days or weeks or months. This was literally instantaneous. Um, and it was, it was pretty like the fact that he thought of like creating those profiles and then translating them with an electromagnet and a pencil, it looked almost like, a like an EKG monitor, like those things that go up and down. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. It's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. And now the next time his wife is dying, you know, he'll get the news faster. So he'll be able to show up in time. She's to buried. See her die. Yeah, that's basically what and then happened. The second generation is what most people think of when they think of Morse code. And that's the one where they're actually tapping and pressing. So all that was doing was people would memorize like mm -hmm. how to send it and you would do you know tap 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 and that's right. how you would send the morse code and it was basically the exact same thing except on the other end the receiver had a roller that would punch a piece of paper or a ribbon and it would do dots and dashes so uh it almost it was like a a, a ticker that it would run on and you could pull that piece of paper off read the dots and dashes and you were good yeah i think it's important for us to call out that he was working along with his buddy Charles Thomas Jackson. Yeah, there's great, a couple of folks. Great involved. grandfather of Michael Jackson. I thought it was Jesse. Uh, oh, maybe that's who it was. Okay. I get I I don't know. Uh, oh none, none of those. None of those. Sorry. Yeah, we're lying. Sorry. So they're working together, but they were working on the single wire telegraph, not to be confused with ones that have more than a single wire. But there were also other folks that were working on this as well that we should probably mention. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, Luke, you know what else we should mention? This week's Luke's rant. Okay. So I'm kind of keeping this related to the telegraph. Okay. Uh, and I think I mentioned this one before. So I, if, if I did, I apologize. These rants kind of run over and they're always timely. <laughs> so the other day they I'm are. sitting in the car, my daughter's going back to high school next week. And she's like, you know, what would be really nice. A phone that lasts more than a, f that has more than four hour battery life. And I'm like, okay, you're going to school. You're there for six hours then you have practice afterwards. Yeah, I, I probably should get you a new phone. So I haven't really looked uh -oh. into phones in a while. Do you know 
the cheapest iPhone. I'm going to go to Verizon's, and I'm going to I'm I'm totally throwing Verizon under the bus. And and I iPhone, know how much my last one was. And so. iPhone's the only thing I want to get her because they're the easiest. They communicate the best. Yada yada yada. I'm sure I'm sure I could find a cheaper phone. So don't. Oh, we're going to get yelled at now. I'm going to get so many emails. That, oh, there's cheap. There are cheaper options, but I want her to get an iPhone. The cheapest non refurbished, like some slimy person was using the phone before I got it. That like some on slug. The phone. Someone that gave the phone COVID. Um, uh, so the cheapest one I could find was four hundred and ninety nine dollars. Oh, that's it's a deal! Literally, like it's an iPhone eleven. It's not even a current generation. It has like sixteen gigs of RAM, and it's just like my like fifteen year old daughter does not need anything that costs five hundred dollars. Wow. Your like, love is endless, Luke. I like that about you. If it was three ninety nine, maybe. Five hundred dollars, but can That's you believe the line. a phone? What mm. happened to like you get a free phone? What happened to that? What what did happen with that? I feel like that was a thing a while. You get a free phone for so I... long. It was a thing, and then you oh. they you upgrade and you get a free phone, and they lock you in for another two years of your life. Like yeah, I remember that. Let's say I decide to be a really nice parent, and I'm going to be mm. all hoity-toity like some people that I know. Hint okay. hint. Uh, <laughs> the 13 Pro Max is a grand. For a phone, is that oh, did, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> Look at all those cameras. You did not get the 13 Pro Max. I can't afford it on my own, but fortunately, oh, it was subsidized. I get it. I get it. Yeah. So my rant is like, there's got. I mean, I don't know. I, I have to do it. It's probably going to happen this weekend. I'm just. I'm sick that I got to spend five hundred dollars for a phone. That's it's that's a good rant, Luke. I think that's a great rant. I think you usually yell at Apple for everything. So yeah. good job. But this is this once is Verizon because Verizon could do it. Okay, they could that's figure true. it out. They could. Sorry. All right, that was good. I liked it. Um, so during the time that he was inventing all this stuff, other inventors or scientists were coming up with the same kind there of idea. Was a lot of them, especially, especially in Europe. So famous German mathematician Carl Gauss and physicist or physics scientist. I would call that a physicist. I would too. Uh, well, clearly I wouldn't since I wrote those words myself. Uh, Wilhelm Weber built the first commercial electromagnetic telegraph in 1833. So this was, what, one or two years before mm -hmm. uh, Sammy put out his first prototype. There was also English inventors, uh, William Billy Cook and uh, Professor Chuck Wheatstone, uh, they started their telegraph four years after they heard about Sam working on his design, but they had a bunch of cash money, and it turns out that helps you get stuff done faster. So they actually only like what only three weeks of work, they managed to build a small electrical telegraph. Three weeks. What was Sam doing all this time? So here's the thing that throws me a little bit. So so they talk about these cats that did this earlier, right? So in 1837, um, uh -huh. I think they were able to, this was the one I was talking about where they could send it 16 kilometers or, or, or 10 13 miles. 13 miles, yeah. Uh, yeah, so somewhere in that neighborhood. But here's the crazy thing. They didn't actually invent the code, m m more Morse. They didn't invent <laughs> Morse code until 1838. So what the heck were they saying to each other? Like, I, I don't know. Loop, blah, I mean, what, that's a good what the, question. What the heck were they saying? Yeah, I'm not sure. That's a great question. Like, huh. I, I huh. don't get it. I don't get it either. Well, they, they could send theirs 13 miles on a multi-wire installation that ran on the Great Western Railway. And so Sam was working on solving these sorts of problems as well. Uh, basically, the inability of sending information great distances is where he got a lot of help from Leonard Gale, a New York University professor. Mm -hmm. uh, so with this help, Morse was able to send information over 10 miles, like you're saying. This was all like encouraging. They're like, hello, this is great. We're going to keep working on it. They got a bunch of financial help um, from Alfred Vail. Uh, and he organized this big public showing in January of 38, 1838. Um, and without an additional power source, the telegraph, I don't know what that even means. Because the they, telegraph, would, they would do boosters along oh, the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. I gotcha. The telegraph had the ability to send a message over two miles. And the first message that was transmitted was, a patient waiter is no loser. I, what so, the heck does that mean, Luke? So I saw that one. 
And then apparently things start to take off a little bit. Yeah. Right. And apparently they ran a, uh, a line in Europe. Um, and then in 1843, they finally got congress to be like okay we yeah, need to yeah. start like sending messages and we can't be like running horses and carrier pigeons and all that kind of stuff so they finally get it so they from uh from baltimore to washington dc this was 1844 that line was co completed on may 24th and do you know what that message was i i do but it, it, yeah, what it was some path god rot it wasn't My that guess something is, about the his... Supreme Court or something? Uh, I'm not, I, I, I didn't look up the meaning of it. I was just assuming it was his kind of pastoral from his dad days. Maybe just something he Maybe. felt like saying. So I think that's on the walls or something of wherever the Supreme Court sits. Oh. But there was something about like a kid or one of his kids picked what it was going to say. It was this whole whole thing but did you see that he got a thirty thousand dollar contract to connect these two buildings i did together? not see that that sounds like big cash money yeah, back then don't you think Heck yeah. yeah yeah so he then continued to keep doing this right a 38 mile telegraph line uh, along the b and o railroad if you play monopoly do you buy the b and o railroad I buy all the railroads when I get a buy chance. All the railroads. Just okay. Yeah, that's fair. Um, the first official use, like you said, 1844. They were also talking about the nomination of Henry Clay as uh, the Whig Party's nomination for president. So that's kind of interesting. Um, what else do you got? I got he instantaneously was involved in a boatload of legal claims. Because, oh, yeah. The rest of his life was yeah, legal problems. Like, apparently, and, and it didn't end for a while. So like until like 10 years later. So finally, after, you know, so he, he does this in 1844. So basically the next 10, 11 years of his life yeah. is just legal claim, legal claim, probably tons of lawyer fees, yada, yada, yada. Um, so finally, the U.S. Supreme Court actually sides with him and gives him the patent rights. Uh, and then essentially he starts raking in the dough. Um, Was it that he got the patent rights? I saw that he secured the rights to be called, quote, inventor of the telegraph, hmm. but that he might have gotten patent rights in other locations instead uh, i saw a stat i saw that established his patent rights was was, okay. was what well, i that's good couldn't. yeah and then eventually he just made a boatload of money he bought a house up in new york overlooking some river had a whole bunch of kids and grandkids and apparently he grew this sweet long biker beard that's and, cool uh, yeah zz uh, top style and he became a uh, an amazing, apparently, philanthropist. He gave a boatload oh. of money away. Vassar College is what Yeah, it yeah. He gave them a ton of money. Um, and fun fact, his actual telegraph, the video that I watched, the, the only thing I could find to show how it actually worked, uh, is in the Smithsonian uh, National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. I saw that, too. One. Yeah, that's super cool. You said he made a boatload of money. So, like, he was poor pretty much forever. And yeah. then he kind of hit the jackpot with this, right? Got like, I think he cash was money. estimated cash monies. He's, he almost has podcast money. He, he was worth like 500,000 at the time. And that in today's dollars is a little over 9 million. So he was doing okay. Like yeah. he's not unprofessional engineering good, but he was good. <laughs> uh, he ended up dying, which is sad. I thought he was still going. Uh, he had pneumonia. He was in New York City in his home when he died. Uh, April 2nd of 1872, uh, while married to his second wife, Sarah Elizabeth Griswold. So what is that? So that's 1872, 1854. So he had a good 15 years or so of like, you know, 12 years of, of no, money, of, of not dealing with legal battles and all that sort of stuff. That's not, what? it's not too shabby, right? What, what more can one man ask for? Yeah. Um, all right. All I have left are some fun facts, Luke. Do you have anything else you wanted to talk I don't. about? I would love to hear your fun facts. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, because telegraph companies typically charged by the word, telegrams became known for their succinct prose, whether they contained happy or sad news. It was super brief what was sent. The word stop, which was free, was used in place of a period because there was a charge for having a period. Huh. 
So all about making that cash monies. Uh, in 1933, Western Union introduced the singing telegram. So that's kind of cool. Um, during World War II, um, well, I guess this is kind of different. Americans would dread the sight of Western Union couriers. So that's different telegrams versus telegraphs. Uh, 1837, telegraph instrument preserved, you said in the Smithsonian. Um, oh, this was creepy. Morse married a second wife, old uh, Sarah Elizabeth Griswold, back in 1848 when he was 57. And she was 26. Yeah, gold digger. (laughs) Good for her. But she was one of the first pupils at the New York School for the Deaf in 1833. Okay, I take it back. And then also (laughs) was therefore helpful in the creation of um, Morse code because of, like you were saying, the dots and dashes. But then how how there was the pencil as well. Right. So how cool is that? Interesting. Yeah. And then you said he gave lots of money to Vassar College as well as to his his friends at Yale College for the, the great work that they did, you know, not failing him, I suppose. You ready? Yeah. You want to know what your name is in Morse code? I do. Let's see. Here it is. So, so James is beep, 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 beep. Wow. Very impressive, Luke. <laughs> It's, it's almost as annoying as me saying it. That is ex- excellent. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to add no, after that I, valuable af- thing? After that, after that gem, I think I'm done. All right. Hopefully you all enjoyed this really insightful thing that one invention this guy made, but he made a lot of paintings too. So there's that. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to say hi, if you want to tell us what your name is in Morse code, or if you want to tell me that it should be pronounced Morris, go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And until next time, see ya.